Welcome to the first episode of the Animal Riot Podcast, brought to you by Animal Riot Press, a literary press for books that matter. It's your producer, Katie, here, and this episode has been edited to reflect our new name. If you're new to the Animal Riot community, welcome, and you can find out more about us at AnimalRiotPress.com. Now on to the episode with your hosts, Brian Birnbaum, and today's guests, Devin Kelly and George Sawaya. Today with me, I have Devin Kelly. Say something about yourself. Hi. Say something really interesting. Uh, um, the finback whale is the world's second largest whale, but the loudest mammal. Okay. I would have gone with the last time we were drinking these drinks, you almost shat yourself. I did almost shit myself. Okay, but we'll move on. We'll move on. George, oh. introduce yourself. George, you're... you're, you're Face has fallen from our taping space, but that's yeah, okay. I'm, I'm invisible, though. I, it makes me easier to talk to. There's an interesting fact. I'm I'm easier to speak to when I can't be witnessed. That's beautiful. How about that? No, it, I think so. Well, I'll introduce myself. I'm Brian, and I uh, co-founded with Katie and uh, our friend John. But really, Devin is yeah. the bellwether for all this shit, aren't you, Devin? You came up with a name for the reading series. I am. I am the bellwether. Yes. So, okay. It's been years. So you guys are writers. I'm a writer. That was the worst introductions I've ever heard in my life. That's okay. We'll, we'll continue. Um, more importantly, we have this hour's brand of fuckery, which will continue on every single episode that we ever make. We'll do something stupid. Yes. Um, and this one is The George Poor. Brought to you by George. George, can you tell us what a George Poor well, is? Well, I, I, you know, I... I I did write down some instructions, and I went over them with George, but I'd be happy to let George actually just go ahead and, and talk about it. Yeah, it's a simple <laughs> principle, really. It's it's a, a concoction like most good things uh, that is born out of hardship, as so many things in the South are. Uh, it's born out of hardship. You've got about uh, $11 for a bottle of whiskey, usually Old Crow. Preferably Jim Beam if you're sitting flush, if it's payday. Or the Dickel. Uh, you get about... A, the Dickel, yeah. The Dickel. Or the, yeah, you could use Dickel as okay, well. Okay, I use that Dickel Williams. as well, but it, need, it needs to be know. a bourbon. Yeah, okay, let me you see. It needs to be a bourbon, and it's not a bourbon. I did it. We did. It's, we we got a bourbon, bourbon here. It, you know, it's, it's not what it's you better want, than, but it's a bourbon. It's not ideal. And then you need <laughs> some kind of soda. Usually uh, a diet Dr. Pepper, if you're watching your figure. You could, they can be... Procured from any, uh, you know, neighborhood gas stations, usually. One or two should do it for the bottle, maybe three. Uh, you take a pint glass, you fill it up to the top, brimming with ice, brimming with the ice, all the way up, all the way up. The ice all you the way You fill up. about three quarters. Yeah. All ice has got to be all the way up. That's yeah. chief. It's I chief that. that the ice must be all the way up. <laughs> I remember Then that. you, you pour in that. about three quarters, three quarters bourbon, top it off with Dr. Pepper, stir and enjoy, imbibe until uh, whatever you're escaping has been thoroughly evaded. Or until something comes to escape you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this well, is true. This time yeah. we'll avoid any marijuana, uh, which I think is what tipped Devin over the edge all those years ago. <laughs> yes. But, uh, yeah, okay. not advisable to, to mix. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless you're me. I like mixing. I will later. Later, I will mix. So the so you you gave us all the instructions, which is great. Thank you for relieving me of that duty. But uh, the last the last instruction, the last directive is to consume the George Poor, which we will now do over the course of this podcast. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then we will talk about something literary. Sapiens: A Brief History of Humankind by Yuval Noah Harari, an Israelite. An Israelite. Is that too biblical? He's from Israel. Basically, George, George thinks, you know, Israel's hilarious. You know, George, do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> not, not, that not that I think would be fitting for this podcast. <laughs> I think enough. Israelite is hilarious. Israelite's the Canaanites. Yeah, it does I sound... I myself am a Phoenician. <laughs> yeah. I'm a Sephardic. I think I, I think <laughs> yeah. I is, a great, is a great suffix for a group of people, and I... I, I I wish that "ite" was used as a suffix for all Brianite. Yes, are we Brianite? I mean, I'm a Washington. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Washingtonian, 
But I wish I was a uh, Washingtonite. Yeah, that'd be better. Or a New Yorkite. Okay. So, Fair anyways, enough. this this uh, Israelite, this young Israel gentleman, wrote a book basically about humans, but not just humans, uh, Homo sapiens in particular. So basically, dating back about seventy thousand years to the emergence of language, essentially. Um, and you know, he goes on to talk about how. Language shaped our origin myths, which controlled populations and set laws and ethics and, you know, created money and, you know, all that motivation for economies and stuff like that. But before he does any of that, he talks about how we evolved past all the other uh, human species and animals in the world because of the ability to tell fiction or to lie, you know, whichever you prefer. Um, And being that we all have engaged in this practice. Narrative. Everyone in the world. Narrative. Narrative. Oral history. Every, everyone in this room has participated in writing fiction as a serious practice, which I would not recommend to anyone else. But uh, we also we all lie and stuff, Ugh. you know. But you know, so we thought this was a good place to start. We're all writers. We're starting a press. We're publishing my novel first, which is you know borderline and not a lie. Cronyism, yeah. maybe it's truly though. but uh anyway yeah. so so fiction is the basis of everything that's what he says you know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing what do we have to what do we have to say about i was that? actually just uh talking about this in my mm-hmm. role as a high school teacher and shaper of young minds um we were reading george have you read the great gatsby oh yeah yeah okay. totally <laughs> there's a pause there <laughs> he's and he's lying we were talking- <laughs> We were talking about. Uh, I'm going to make this quick because I, I don't want to. I don't want to take up most of the space here, which I inevitably won't. Um, but we were ranking. We did an exercise. We just finished the book, and we did an exercise ranking the main characters in The Great Gatsby from most honest to least honest. Ooh. And when we initially did it, all the students I had ranked Nick Carraway, the narrator of The Great Gatsby as the most honest person simply because he was the the narrator. Off the hip, I probably would have Uh, said the same. um, And it was interesting to introduce the idea to them that Nick Carraway um, is, one, fictional um, and not F. Scott Fitzgerald. And because of that, um, could contain an element of unreliability as a narrator and so it's sort of a fictional representation of the unreliability of narrative as a practice that's meta for um as a practice for 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 conveying truth and um i i did a quick little example with them of like anytime you tell a story i was talking Mm -hmm. to them that you think is funny and no one laughs the first thing you do if you tell that story again is what? What do you do? I don't know. Change the punchline? Yeah. You, well, you, you do some sort of <laughs> embellishment. You, yeah. you embellish like... You so do better. You do, yeah, you tell it better. <laughs> you, yeah, you tell it better, which in essence means you have to incorporate some element of the lie. Yeah. Um, no, that's 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 yeah. interesting, Dev, because because uh, you're talking like like so. What you're saying is that there's almost like a snowball effect that we get the reward of a of a laugh when we tell a story, and that encourages like further hyperbole, further fictionalizing, like a like the the, the more outlandish it becomes, like the, uh, fish. the more feedback, like positive feedback we get. Yeah, like the fish, like the fish. Yeah, every time you, every time you tell the fish story, your hands grow farther apart. Oh, oh that's, like the, yeah, the, the, okay. The, the, yeah. the fish I caught. Yeah, I thought yeah. the fish was some sort of story yeah. we all read in grad school. <laughs> <laughs> now, remember and, and that, that everything... you tied that back to... <laughs> go ahead, George. Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was George. just no, going to say that... that... <laughs> that you tied that back to, to, to honesty. I was reading an article a while back about why humans, and this will tie back into uh, sapiens as well, why humans are so uh, piss poor at detecting lies. That we're just we're we're not good at it. Uh, that a human being has about a fifty four percent chance, if I'm remembering correctly, of of telling when there's a lie. So a little wow. bit better hmm. than than a, than a coin flip that. for That's for a, being able for being able to identify when you're being lied to because that, yeah. we don't have a lot of practice. Like we don't get feedback when we're when we're when we're right and we think somebody's lying. Uh, a lot of the times they'll just deny it. Uh, and then when we're wrong and we we're sure that <laughs> my somebody's policy. lying, like we can't be convinced, you know, so we're, we're bad at lying because we're, we're, we're a, we're unpracticed at it. 
and B, because we don't get a lot of feedback. So even the best of us is marginally better than a coin toss, uh, which, uh, which, which is why we have so many fictions and why fictions are so good for us, perhaps. We can't segregate uh, fact from, from fiction quite as aptly as we think we can. That's interesting. I, I like your point. I don't know if we're unpracticed at lying so much as we're unpracticed at, at – I'm trying to think about – because I think we're all good at lying because we're all – for the, everyone's told us mm. – so, I think in this day and age, we're probably worse at lying than ever. I would think, yeah, just because maybe. of all the tools that are you know out there to parse our lies and stuff like that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, relating back to fiction, I'll say the the moment I realized I got to be a better writer was when I stopped trying to reveal truths and started just writing shit that I thought seemed real to me, which seems like a contradiction in terms, but. It's not. It's a. Uh, it turns. It turns like kind of like a serious, like academic sort of uh, endeavor into something that I'm just kind of playing around with. And when we're playing around, is when we're telling jokes, I guess you know. And so yeah. you spin a better lie that way. <laughs> but you know, I mean, obviously, fiction has a, a verisimilitude that everyone seeks, but not in every book. Yeah, I could. I could. Well, when you say when you say not trying to like write truth. Uh, do you mean sort of like uh, attempting attempting profundity in, in a way? Like you, That's you're, you're having fun with, yeah, yeah. I don't think profundity is enjoyable. You know, uh, I think <laughs> I think if people wanted profundity, they could they could pick up one of the great holy books of the world and <laughs> and, and find themselves yeah. beset by by wisdom. You know, or the scarlet. I, letter. I think people have to be, Scar- yeah, or the scarlet letter. People have to be fooled into into epiphany or 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 you know hoodwinked into mm. into wisdom you can't just throw it at them unless you're a poet on twitter or uh, a prognosticator in one of america's yeah. great news channels i think um, being I you think, you have to well i think your line being fooled into epiphany is is a great little is a great great little catchphrase that's a good memoir title by yeah the way. well yeah fooled into epiphany fooled into epiphany <laughs> That's great. Would shamefully be a, a best-selling memoir by mm-hmm. someone who doesn't deserve that title. But um, the idea of being fooled into epiphany is, is quite apt, I think, when you consider what quality narrative and fiction does for you. I'm thinking of like people like Barry Hanna. I'm thinking of, of like storytellers who do not seem on the surface level like they are dealing with universal truths until you finish the story and realize that they've been dealing with universal truths the whole time. Yeah, and that's a skill because to write something and to put it down and know that you might be navel-gazing half the time and then yeah. you wake up and you're like, oh, shit, I got to relate this to other people. I mean, that doesn't happen with every story or everything you write, but sometimes it does. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, that's... That that's that's the pinnacle of, of fiction. I mean, if you want to if you want to reach profundity, you got to reach everyone, and you're not going to do that on a line to line basis. There's only a few books I've read that you get to the last line and you're like, oh shit, I just got gut checked, you know. They they asked this of, of Hemingway when he was given his Nobel Prize. They said uh, they were talking specifically about uh, the Old Man in the Sea, and somebody had the well, I, what I can only imagine was the nerve to ask him. Uh, how he was able to construct to construct such a such an allegory. Uh, it was it was most it was one of his most allegorical works. They claimed, and Hemingway, of course, said that, that he was never trying to write an allegory. That he never yeah, that, tries to write anything. That, that makes completely that makes complete sense to me because I couldn't tell you what fucking allegory lies in in that in that novella. <laughs> like what 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 is that? <laughs> like honestly, bring like, the fish in the boat. I think symbolism is. <laughs> I think symbolism it's an is really for fishing. Yeah, yeah. It's a quality book. It's a fishing. metaphor for the for the thing that we're doing. Um, <laughs> no, I, I honestly think that symbolism can be very powerful, but I think it's also bullshit more than ninety percent of the time. To be honest, I think it's uh, projected by the reader, which is yeah. fine. You know, it's death of the author like shit. But yeah. you know, well, I mean, I I've I've felt that I've felt this realization in a in in quite. A more hardcore way teaching high school English because you focus when you're teaching high school English, you focus on those terms that you feel like you're never going to use again, like symbolism. And we were reading, we read Scarlet Letter to open, which is replete with symbolism. That's true. We never talked about symbolism in in grad school because why would we do that? Because, yeah, you like we read Scarlet Letter and 
everything becomes a symbol. And then you, and then we read the great Gatsby and everything is also a symbol like the green light or, um, the green light or the, the, <laughs> the billboard with Dr. Eckelberg's eye, eyeglasses or the yellow car or just anything that has a color. And it serves a purpose to tie a bow around the novel. Like the green light comes back at the end and it gives you like sort of a huh feeling. Uh-huh. I think especially if you're 17 or 16 and right. reading this and, and realizing, I think it's nice it's nice at that moment to to be like that young and realize that someone can like tie a bow around something that magnificent or like that holistically, I don't know. But at the same time it does nothing to further truth or narrative. The only thing I think symbolism serves to do is potentially relate to human experience in that we endow right. our life we endow things in our life with meaning. Yep. Um, but those things themselves don't actually further our lives like they do in a novel. Like like an author can put a thing in a novel to carry the momentum of a novel. That's symbolism. But in our lives, if we are truth-telling through fictionalizing, like nothing holds significance other than what we give significance to. Right, yeah. And that's why fiction is so- kind of like a lie that yeah. is a truth. But before we continue about you know this conversation, I want to mention that I think our biggest goal on this podcast is to get more women on it because we're talking about the Scarlet Letter right now and it's just a bunch of dudes. Yes, and that's fine. But uh, <laughs> moving on, yeah, I want. I'm curious as to how much of that symbolism was taught to you. How much did you pick up yourself? Because I couldn't tell you because basically, virtually every book that was given to me in high school, I did not read. I didn't start yeah. seriously reading until I was eighteen Which or nineteen. I'm also old, re- realizing you know? as a high school teacher now. Most of my kids don't read the book. <laughs> yeah, 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 which is which is a fact. I mean, like, you know, especially when I learned that you could just read the Cliff's notes. I, this is, like, poor – This is I'm not a good role model because I, well, I should there, be – I should There's be, also, like, 85 different versions of Cliff notes now. Yeah, that, that, Schmoop, <laughs> Spark Notes. Don't Cliff even notes. tell me, man. Schmoop is, Schmoop is the thing that all the kids – should I, keep sh- should I write a Cliff's Notes for my own book? Is that like the most narcissistic you thing? Yeah, you should it, yeah. Just schmoop it? Schmoop it. You can yeah, put a little... Just <laughs> own, I'm going to schmoop my own yeah. book. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's why, I have, that's why my only tattoo says uh, symbols can be beautiful sometimes. It's also misspelled. It is. It is misspelled. Yeah, yeah. it's something that could have been corrected that I chose not to have corrected because I thought it was, I thought it was apropos. It's why we first liked you in the in the first place. Because I was such a right, George. Up. The misspelled tattoo. Yeah, I still I still uh, forget where it's from. You told me once. Is it Joyce? Is that where it comes from? It's Vonnegut, I believe. I'm not Brian. Vonnegut. Um, it is Vonnegut, though. I'm still tattooless. I'm open for suggestions. I think you should. Uh, I definitely think you should get a dick tattoo. Because here's the thing: dick tattoos. They are almost. They're like accordions. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's like if you decorated an accordion. Brian is only one third done with his uh, George Ford <laughs> and has already brought up the dick tattoo as a viable, as a viable, a, I think it's a viable a- enterprise for inking permanently one's yeah. own skin. At yeah. some point, I'm going to start speaking from the peanut gallery over here and just bleeping you on air. Uh, okay, yeah. that's fine. That's fine. I've really? already I've already said that George oh, hates oh, Jews, oh. which is just not true. And like you know, I I'm, <laughs> that's, that's fake news. <laughs> it's an inside joke because George is Lebanese and I'm, you know, some form American. Of, yeah, I'm a I'm a Jewish American, which means next to nothing until I go to the airport and TSA pulls me over. <laughs> What were you we talking about? My tattoo? That's why you guys liked me? When George said no tattoo he hasn't had, then you Oh, right. The, the, the dick tattoo. Right. No, and it's important because... We're getting back there. It's important because, A, if you want a real dick tattoo, you have to somehow maintain an erection for the duration of the tattoo being, you know... <laughs> I'm getting... <laughs> George, George is dying over here. Katie's giving me directions on was, Microsoft Word. Was that Katie slapping <laughs> the desk? It sounded Well, like. first of all... It's like it's like the no maybe that's the next challenge, you know the Odyssey is another challenge we could do on this show. That w- I would do, it. and we should talk about that another time. Maybe this maybe this episode, but you know at some other later date. I practically did it on Saturday. 
Did you? Well, I did. Yeah, I you, did, you did the 50 miler, right? I did three of them. I did three of the things. Okay, so you, you ran the 24 or 26. What was it? 26? 24. 24. You didn't drink. I drank a lot of beer. Okay, okay so let's backtrack. And let's explain the Odyssey. There are four elements to the we Odyssey. Are, we are going off topic. No, this is no. I mean, everything. This topic. is why we picked Sapiens because everything that falls yeah. under well, the I umbrage of human kind. Everything we say <laughs> falls under the umbrage of, the, uh, of the a human Odyssey. Kind. Is a. Uh, I'm going to hold this uh, for a bit until we, uh, until we remember it. Um, it is a four part challenge that is. Uh, is a 24-hour challenge. Four criteria. With, yeah, it's a 24-hour challenge with four criteria yeah. that was conceived of uh, when I was a competitive collegiate runner. There Did are, you come up with it? No. Oh, okay. It was, it was, it was bequeathed to us. Um, there are four by, numbers. By Odysseus himself. Yeah, there are four numbers, uh, 6, 12, 18, and 24, and there are four activities. Uh Miles run, donuts eaten, beers drunk, and I'm gonna say self orgasms ch- achieved. Yeah, for the for to, orgasms achieved. Orgasms by, achieved, yeah. but by the self, but not yeah, not you, not um, applied like, to someone else. Yeah, yeah right, and right. so the idea is that you, can especially take, not uh, if not yeah. consensually, that yes. you know, we and, and the idea that is that you could do, you can pair any activity with any number but you have to and so for for men i would say speaking as a man i would uh recommend six six orgasms, orgasms and yes. then the rest Naturally. is the rest actually is sort of up for grabs my go to would be 24 miles around and 18 18 i would say 18 beers, pe- beers. Or donuts. those are interchangeable the yeah, 12 and, and the 18 and I'd say the 12 and the 18 are interchangeable and and so this saturday mm-hmm. i ran 50 miles and I drank probably 14, 14 beers that day. Okay. And I had... So you did more than you needed to. I had no for orgasms the 12. achieved. And, okay. Um, but you had a lot... You had... A lot of beer. And I had a donuts. lot of donut-y things. I oh, said, okay. I went, well, you know... I, I, I went okay. to Waffle House. Okay. You know, so you weren't doing the challenge, so we can't say anything, yeah. you know, necessarily and derogatory about it. it's absurd what, what you eat. During a 50 miler, like all I ate during the race was uh, I drank probably a liter of Coca Cola mm-hmm. and ate six or seven handfuls of M Ms and a Stroop waffle. Do you not think that caffeine gets in the way at some point? I think I go. You? I think I went to it too early. Yeah, that's this is too a, much. This is for a podcast of a different time. No, it's all uh, you know. It's all, it's all relevant. No, you know. We're gonna bring I think it back. I think you've we're all. Try, we're gonna try and bring George back into. This. No, I think I think you've all <laughs> know a Harari. <laughs> You know, George, I don't know if you'd agree, but I think he'd think that everything we're saying is is relevant to what he, you know, his experience. I, I, I think we should bring it back to narrative as a <laughs> narrative as a, a device, <laughs> as as a deceitful mechanism. You know what, George? I would like action. to pose you a question, George. Can I? Can I? Pose you got you a it. Question. Yeah, I would like to pose. You, uh, what do you think is a more efficient and perhaps? Um, Artistically, I'm gonna come up with a word here. I'm halfway done with a, a mediocre George Poor. Artistically <laughs> powerful. I'm gonna say this: efficient and artistically powerful way to convey truths about the world and ourselves. Fiction, oh, or oh, poetry. Oh man. Yeah. So I, I uh... and and I and you like I for our audience, I would like to. Uh, give a bit of background that George, I think, is one of the finest unknown poets in America. Unknown? He's, he's I, know, I, I know of him. <laughs> yeah. And That's he's, a bit this strong. Man, this, man has been, this man's been published before for Christ's sake. He's in, poets. he's in poets.org. What's, what, is it, is, what's your answer so which, to that question, George? Which is more able? Is that, is that yeah, essentially before, yeah, what George, we're George, down to? George, before, yeah, before you start, I need, I, need to, I need to announce – well, first of all, wow, I am buzzed already. Jesus. I'm already these, at 30 minutes. Yeah, these George Pours – I'll tell you guys. These George Pours, they'll get, they'll get you. Straight to the dome, baby. Straight to the dome. Straight to the dome. Okay, so I, I just want to state for the record, I am a fiction writer. I actually have like minor contempt for poets because I think so many of them suck. And I know that fiction writers have the same proportion of suckers – but at the same time, like reading fiction is so much less abstract, especially, you know, especially at times, you know, 
poetry can be a word salad sometimes. Well, it's like fiction. If it's a word word salad, you're reading Henry Miller on acid or some shit like that. You know, I mean, not that he wrote fiction. He wrote some deranged form of memoir, but you know, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, so that's the score here. So we got two poets. Devin writes fiction, but not anymore. You know, he kind of quit on the game over there. He's, he's a poet and a nonfiction writer. Uh, and, 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 you know, me, we got me over here. So, okay. Continue, George. Well, I don't, I don't think that it could possibly be answered. Right. I don't, uh, I mean, because, I because if we, if we, wow. if we, if we, if we answer this question, we have to ask ourselves like, which, which medium of art, which art medium has the most truth potential, the truth potential. There's another good The old TP. Uh, the truth potential, because I mean, you know, uh, Obviously, this is what we do. The writing is one of the oldest uh, forms of artistic and informational exchange. We convey things to ourselves every day through some kind of language, right? Whether it's audible or not. I, you know, I wouldn't say that a that a piece of statue, uh, like statuary, like like a, like a, a, a really artistic piece of Italian marble. A uh, statuary could do as much as, say, a uh, novel could, right? I don't think I'm going to get a lot of pushback on that. Did you? Yeah, but I mean, I did, you just, did you just compare? Marble, <clears throat> did you just compare a a bust to the written word? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we're talking about like the, <laughs> the about truth art. potential yeah. of of artistic mediums here, right? Fair enough. Like fair a enough. fixed slab, a fixed slab is only. It's not. I mean, you it can be witnessed. Uh, but I still think that like a piece of visual art is probably capable of a little of, of conveying a little more than the face of George Washington, you know, like you could find at the Met there in New York. Right. I simply and I mean, like even even really like the most dramatic pieces. Of I don't know, man. Statuary. Enough, now, enough, I mean, like en- modern enough, sculptures. Enough, not- enough dead, pre- enough dead presidents in my room. And like, you know, I feel artistically fulfilled. Well, also to, I, well, to, you know I mean? to quickly counteract the point that George has not made, but as a, as, <laughs> as a, as a, yeah, he's talking, he's talking about fucking like the, as the a thinker or as something. A poet, <laughs> as a poet, George, and we've talked about this poem, uh, Rilke's archaic torso of Apollo, the one that, the one that ends, you must change your life. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, of course. Which is a poem about a statue. Yeah, which is what is uh uh what's that called? What's the word for it? Ekphrastic. Ekphrastic. It's, a, it's an ekphrastic yes. poem as yeah, is WH Auden's uh the one about Icarus, uh, Musée des Beaux-Arts. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um about suffering they do not the old masters. Rilke's poem is an ekphrastic about a statue that is missing so much. And I would argue the poem it well it it puts your point into some sort of perspective because the poem would not exist without the incomplete statue. But the poem itself, to me, renders more meaning than the statue hmm. because of the incompleteness yeah. of the statue. I mean, Maybe that in and of itself, that double sort of existence of both is a good sort of uh, reckoning for art itself that one cannot exist without the other. And th- but that's all great and good. It is great and good. But we wanted, as I am. we wanted, <laughs> but we wanted mm-hmm. to know. We wanted George's what, opinion. You you euphemistically said, "What's better, poetry yeah. or fiction?" And George, didn't that's say, basically what yeah, you and said. George didn't put it. And over, George, and I, want, and, I want someone before we even continue with the conversation. I'm going to count to three. No, but okay, at the we'll end do of three, that. all right, okay. you have to say poetry or fiction. George, you on board? Oh man, you I have can't to. You this put is me in such. This you have to. This I'm is say phoning it in. Where we all know what we're going to say. What I want to do. I might say fiction. What I want to do is I say, must say fiction, but what we, you, you said you said basically better at revealing truth, mm-hmm. but we have to define truth because we were just talking about how uh, fiction has a better ability. Yeah, maybe, to, we, maybe we end the podcast by us doing the one, two, three. I kind of like that idea actually. Yeah. Uh, what is? Are we asking like what do we mean by truth when we say revealing truth? <laughs> it seems to me like we need to go to a question of what what does good art do in the first place. That's yeah. Oh wow. Um, wow. So we're gonna go in a circle and we're gonna start with. George. Uh, the question George, is, what does what does good art do? Is that is that the question? What does good art do? What does good art do? W D G A D. What does it do? What does it do? And why do we do it still? Considering that well, let's do the, this what dude is, says that do, fiction. No, I mean he says that fiction true. is the thing that we is the launching pad for our entire species. You know, so why do we still do it? 
is it still necessary? I mean, obviously it's performed in our political spheres and such things like that, you know, content, you know, go ahead. Let's get some platitudes out of the way first, because oh, yes. there are too many platitudes Another about good memoir this. Title. Right. So, so the, <laughs> the one that you're going to see, like, uh, speaking of tattoos, the one you might see tattooed on some people is, is Ars Gratia Artist, right? Art for art's sake. That one's pretty good. I don't mind that platitude. But then there's the other one, right? What's how's it go? Art, good art should uh, disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. Wow. No, oh, that's man. nonsense. You got them lined up. Uh, just bandolier, man. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I just, that's that's garbage, right? And then there's this whole idea that anyone who 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 creates art is attempting to escape death. That's also bullshit. Uh, right. Like, a, I mean, yeah, I mean in, in many ways, I think making, making art, making art, uh, uh, pulls us toward, uh, uh, the, the impermanent, right. You, you were talking about the difference between poetry and fiction. It's, it's my assertion that poetry celebrates the impermanent while fiction attempts to preserve, uh, something, uh, that's, that's, I, that's what I contest, but what, what must good art do? Uh, good art must be different. It's gotta be, it's gotta be advancing the narrative, right. Especially when we talk about, fiction we're talking about contributing to the great conversation right if all you've got to do is is bang the same you know like bad detective story drum uh or another another iteration of like a vaguely interesting uh commercial uh uh literature like i don't know why you're doing it i don't know why you're doing it if you're not trying to to further the craft if you're not trying to do something different uh, or or capture something unique. I think that's what good art does. I think I think anything else that just sort of uh, follows behind everything that's already been done is is not is not necessarily art. I think it's just commodity uh, masquerading as as creativity. So there you go. But you do come at this stuff from somewhat of a conventional angle, somewhat of drawing from tradition. So how do you draw? How, how, how do you how do you reconcile that with pushing the technology forward? Well, I th- I think I mean we we can we can I'm not going to, <laughs> but we could talk about the last hundred years of literature, and we could talk about the last hundred years of style, right? Where certain things have been innovated, uh, given you know any any literary decade or school. Uh, here at the onset, or at least almost twenty years into the 21st century, uh, I think the last for me the last place that I feel qualified to innovate within. Uh, a tradition is the tradition of genre and bending genre to make it do uh, things that it hasn't been asked to do before. Uh, that's what that's what I like to do. So where, where do you see room for uh, experimentation on the level of prose? I mean, not just not just, uh, you know, fiction or nonfiction, even even uh, lines like, you know, verse. Um do you not think that there's room to grow there? Because I mean, I think separate, distinct from the literary scene, language is constantly evolving. I mean, you know, due to technology, whatever slang, whatever you want to call colloquialisms. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I've moved away from experimental stuff as I've gotten older, but at the same time stayed there because I believe in the value of the new. You know the value of a new perspective or a new voice yeah. or what what may, what whatever it may be. You know, uh, uh, you know, detached from any like of that kind of like politically driven uh, locus of like whom it's coming from. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, when, I mean, again, when we look back at the 20th century, right? There, there's so many people that are playing with the prose on the on the level of the prose, right? Down in the sentence, doing things. Uh, you have, you know. Uh, uh, Hemingway, uh, even uh, Faulkner, of course. You've got Joyce. I mean, they they practically broke the system and and contributed. Oh yeah, um, Fal- style Faulkner. for the for the next hundred years. Right, Fal- Faulkner practically invented the voice of an autistic gentleman. Essentially, I mean, I don't think, I don't, yeah. think, I don't think anyone's anyone's written about that before. If I'm not, and then I mean, you've got mistaken. you've got Gertrude Gertrude Mother's Stein, Tinder Buttons. Yeah. I mean, you're you're. Yeah, Stein especially. It's it's happening all over the place. You know, uh, the twenties was was that revolutionary time, but but that, that that struggled to carry on through, say, like the sixties or even the fifties. I mean, we we had we had the beat poets, which I, I you know I think are quite divisive. I think most people, if you're if you're really into uh, literature, especially poetry, you 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 either fall one place or the other on the uh, on the beats. But but then you of course you have like the Langpos, 
right? The language poets who were just dreadful across the board, right? I forget the poem, Devin, you may remember it, where, where, it's, where it's just one person reading uh, like from zero to a hundred and, and they just get more worked up about it. Zero, one, two, and then they just get really into it towards the end. 98, 99, you know, things like that. That's, I'm sorry, that's, you've, you've lost me, right? Who, yeah, so okay. For every action, equal and, well, it's, equal it's and the, opposite. It's like, like the, the poetic avant-garde. equivalent of John Cage's 433. Is it 433? Yeah, the, who are these people? This, I don't know who the la- yeah. who the language poets are. I don't even a lot of I honestly poets. don't even know who the beat poets are because I only know the beat Ginsburg, fiction writers. You've Ginsburg, you've got uh Ferlinghetti, you've got uh Kerouac and, writing fiction. So Ker- Kerouac wrote fiction. Was he cl- were were they like was he and Burroughs and all them were they close with these guys? These yeah, poets. Uh, they, that's yeah. that same scene, right, George? Yeah, oh yeah, totally. I think a lot of them who was who was the who was the um, was it Burroughs that they all sort of looked up to until he got high on smack and shot his wife in the face and nobody yeah. minded about and you have, it? Yeah, Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> yeah, and he was kind of the best sort of, of them. <laughs> Gonzo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I that, mean, really, that's yeah. that's what the Beats gave us more than anything was Hunter S. Thompson. You know, for what he was for what he was worth. I know he's divisive as well, but I, I quite like Hunter. Oh yeah, I, I like him. Rum a lot. Diaries, great. I like him a lot. Well, I, I Gonzo, think so. Gonzo journalism, like Tom Wolfe too. I think puts calls a lot of fiction into question like i is tom, tom wolf a beat i would say he is he's like from, he was like 30s wasn't he no tom wolf the journalist is not a well he just passed away i wouldn't call him a beat he's from i would call him like new school journalism avant-garde he's sort of he i would say he is uh, descended from that burroughs hunter s thompson sort of like Take give yourself a lot of permission to call truth whatever truth is, uh-huh. and I find I find some of Tom Wolf stuff. I read it because he died this year. I read the right stuff about the about the um, astronauts going to space, which got a lot was a bestseller, but also got a lot of criticism because there's a great deal of things extrapolated potentially in the in the book, and it calls itself nonfiction. Um, but I found it unbelievably entertaining and a portrait of an era. And I think there is a lot of truth in its fiction, which I think is maybe should bring nonfiction into the realm of conversation, conversation, because what we call truth is so often not a lie and what we call lies. Yeah. So and I think that's, truth. I honestly am starting to realize that that's the, uh, that's the nucleus of this conversation, because if we're talking about, if we're talking about how you can lie and make fictions and make great stories that reflect on our actual experience, our real experience, and teach us lessons and emotions and all that great stuff, yet we and, – and, and, and in addition to that, we have this person, Harari, who's basically you know written an entire book on human history based on the idea that we can create fiction in order to further ourselves. What – truth what what role does truth have in in what we're doing on a day-to-day basis well our politics certainly calls that into question easily the most important realm i think yes you know i think more so than anyone's sort of podunk novel or poem and of course science like i mean science is science is is beyond a, a, a narrative truth which would be what's being deployed in politics right changing the narrative uh changing the popularity but i mean if there's if there's any objectivity uh, it it has to come from physics. It has to come from, from chemistry. Science. It has yeah, to come from But what if from, what if we live in a science. world where science is completely disregarded? Well, as also, it's being now, like like uh, or or better yet, we live we in do. a world. We, li- we, we live in a world. Well, ha- it's you know almost like fifty percent disregarded, give or take. But but we do live in a world in which science is not complete and never will be complete. Correct. And that, so that's, that's the big ticket right there yeah. because we have to we have to work our way around. The fact that we don't know exactly what's going on, we never really totally will. And so these representations, these metaphors still have value, obviously, in our society. Yeah. That's why we keep writing fiction, I guess, to answer the Maybe. question we've been driving I mean, like at. It's, but I, it's like we live in a world where where, where our presidents – because we all here have the same president. Uh, his response to the wildfires still raging in California was that we should have more deforestation. Which is a scientific lie. 
um, that that it is perhaps the for like the, or what they would call in tech a uh, a greedy algorithm yeah. because it's basically doing the thing that's easiest that you see before you that doesn't take the long term yeah. into effect. Like you know? if we take down all the forest, then there's no trees to catch fire. But we don't understand that, or we we are just lying to ourselves that that it is the taking down of the forest that, in large respects, is causing the fire, um, or is one cause. And so, to we live in a world where such where the like fiction, nonfiction, and poetry take a backseat to whatever our president says. Always, would you agree? Oh yeah, I mean a caboose seat on, yeah. the, on the long train of American legislation and and, yeah. and economy. And so, yeah. if we if we live in a world where even our artful lies take a backseat to someone's less artful, politically motivated lies. What is the purpose of our artful lies? Ostensibly, well, no, not even ostensibly. It's a great question, Devin. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Our more artful lies have a lot of value because the people that are comprehending them also comprehend the fact that they are lies and they turn them into truths themselves. When we're forced to accept the truth without interpretation i think that's that becomes a a huge problem and that that's where in modern times we've we've run into trouble in terms of we can't even agree on facts so when you take that into consideration you know no george go ahead yeah we need some george Uh, no i was was just going to tie that back to i was just going to tie that back to nonfiction because because i mean you, you say people are happy to receive our lies right our fictions and live in them and swim in them and, and make them real for themselves, right? We're selling them, we're selling them an imagination for a little while. We're giving them some characters. We're we're we're, we're giving them uh, uh, hopefully some some uh, a distraction at, at, at worst, uh, something that could change their perspective at best, hopefully, right? Uh, but when when somebody buys a nonfiction book and it turns out later that that nonfiction author was lying through their teeth the whole time, a million little people are pieces. ready to grab the pitchforks and the torches. Exactly. James Frey, I believe was his name, right? Uh, he's been practically wiped from the bookshelf, right? Because because he's been he's been erased because people get so upset when they think they're being sold the truth or that which is truthful. And when it turns out not to be, they think they've been swindled. Yet when somebody buys fiction, they don't have this issue. They go, oh, I, I admit what it is. And that's because of the emotional connection that we that we are more willing to give to that which claims to be true. Than we are to that which claims to be fiction, but we we do still, of course, have tremendous attachments, emotional attachments to fiction, fandom uh, in in all of its ways, be it for a television show or a cartoon series or a book or a series of books. Right, Game of Thrones comes to mind. People are crazy for it, right? So, which which is it that has the greater capacity for obsession? Is it is it the thing that claims to be a truth, or is it the, the thing that admits that it's that it's uh, imagine that, that it's imaginary, but that can produce something like an yeah. emotional truth in each of us. I mean, are they equal forces, greater than or equal to? I think, well, yeah. I mean, I, I think you just basically touched on the fact that politically, uh, the former is true. <coughs> whatever, whatever can convince us of being fact is the most important thing yeah. politically, well, and 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 emotionally on an individual basis. Unfortunately, because we haven't institutionalized. I guess emotions. We mm-hmm. have not done that to to this point, other than mental health. I do think I do think that fiction, all create all all forms of literary work, do do something on us for that. But fiction in particular, and poetry for that matter, do a do a great deal of work on directing the ability for us to feel and to think and and sure. kind of widen that circumference of. Of human experience, which I don't think politics does. I think in a lot of ways it narrows it um, I, and constricts it. But I, I also worry that, and this perhaps isn't like a uh, a great thing to say. And nor- normally, n- normally I have. I'm going to relate it back to my my current job as a high school teacher. I am a high school teacher, which is why he drinks. Um, and um, I get the question a lot of, of like. Uh, Mr. Kelly, why are we reading this book? Of which I have truly no response. Um, <laughs> um, there is the one response I, I usually go to, which I think is like sort of paraphrased from Baldwin, which is essentially that like 
we read books to to make us us feel individually less alone in the world. We find in them a narrator or a, a protagonist or an antagonist, someone or some feeling that makes us feel like we are less alone in the world. Like the way in which we think about the world is not as different as we think it is. I wonder sometimes whether we are more inclined I wonder what I wonder when I think about that is like I think that that is a great thing because I think so often that art does address the feelings of people who are so often unaddressed by large portions of discourse. But I also wonder about like how often it is that we pick up a book with a narrator that we just despise. And because we have nothing to relate in that narrator, we put the book down. And I wish that we could keep reading that book with that awful narrator. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I don't, I don't want us to live in a world where we just simply read things that have or, or relate to things that have people that we can easily relate to. I want to live in a world where, the, where we, we do challenge ourselves to sort, of, to sort of enter into the lives, especially in an artful way, of people that we cannot relate to. I think, and I think that that is a much larger discussion. It is. It is. It, it has to do with censorship. I think that's where uh, sensitivity readings come in, to be honest. And not that the, those are a bad thing. They're definitely a good thing. I mean, I think it's important that we're relating to people that we are not in direct contact with and so on. But uh, I totally agree. I think that the dirt of our society should be recognized in order for study, if anything else, you know? Yeah. Considering that we brought up truth telling in our modern society, um, do you think that writing, and this is to everyone in the room, is a that writing in and of itself is a viable means of enacting change? Progressing the human Progressing change, human progressing race. the human race. Right. Yeah. In this moment right mm -hmm. now. In this moment that we stand right now, like what what viability does does writing have to do anything? Does it? George, your turn. Hmm. I, I don't. Maybe it, it, it used to have more of uh, an ability to do this, uh, but I feel that uh, the marketplace of ideas is too loud now. I think if you want to, if you it's, want it's to so enact, it, it, it's too, there's too much of it. I mean, like, so. And and that go, that goes for everything it goes for everything except for like major films because the the price point to get in on like creating a major motion picture is tremendous right so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to have that money if you want to make a movie all you have to have to make a book uh, yourself, I mean if yeah. if you're the author all you have to have is paper and pen right um, it, I think it costs it, it's, it, writing has got to be the cheapest commodified art form con, I mean in the in the contemporary marketplace of ideas. Uh, uh, but of course, we, we we talk about frequently uh, in our interpersonal lives the the sort of gatekeepers, the presses that that sort of throttle or or produce these things. And of course, they're looking at it from a business perspective. You know, we we think about those great books, right? Uh, the great books of history that may or may not have had more of an impact on the societies in which they were initially released that could have eventually spread elsewhere, uh, for good or bad. But I, I don't know now. Honestly, now if you want to sell a book, it, it practically has to be made into a movie before it sells considerably. I, you um, know, you know, George, I agree with I agree with that, and uh, you know, that's kind of the reason why we are starting the press. Our sort of rebuttal to that is that we want to acquire books that we feel deserve to be out there and that progress our species if that's a if that's the right way to put it i mean i, I really think it is but to pr to prove why we want to do this is because we want to invest in our writers so if our writers can make an impact on people around us and the communities around us the communities that we interact with we want to invest in them and 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 george what you're saying is has to it, it comes down to money it really does uh, you know it comes down to the society we live in and if we invest in our writers, we believe that we will put out work that does affect the kind of change that writing may have used to or still does to a certain degree, maybe to a, lar uh, to a lesser per capita extent. 
but we want to increase that. That's our goal. I want to. I want to. I want to. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I want to clarify something because I think that there are th- that there are ideas out there uh, that are enacted in fiction form that can change, can affect change. Uh, it's just for as, as far as the consumer is concerned, it's how do we find those, right? So that so that if you if you if your brand is centered on that then I think that that is, you know, declaring uh, uh, the mission statement of the press. We, we want to publish uh, ideas. We want to publish things that are furthering the narrative, things that are furthering the conversation, uh, you know, and, and people know that about the press uh, and people can find those kinds of things there. Uh, but, you know, you come to, as a, as a former librarian, right, you come to the library and, and you want uh, you, you have that question. You pose that question to me as an adult services librarian. You know, which of these books is going to is going to change me? Uh, like, I don't. You know, I would have a hard time just taking you to the shelf, right? I, I, I could show you the books that changed me, the books that that historically changed something. But now, I mean, like we had 150,000 materials at, at my former library, which was a medium sized library. It's just so much. It's so much. It's the same with TV. It's the same with music. You know, uh, new forms of delivery have have the market swollen up like that. So there needs to be a place for that very reason. Yeah, and why that it thus thus ends my interjection. Well, I think I I think to your point, George, the the response to me, especially because we are living in, I would say, late capitalism, is that if you want to affect change. You affect change by investing in your community, and you invest in the community of relatively like-minded folks and their tangential counterparts, and you don't – you actually don't shoot for the moon. You shoot for the streetlights. Like, you shoot for uh, little goals that you think are right above you um, because most of – everything is unachievable in late capitalism. Wow. And um, (laughs) unless you have $10 billion, most of everything is deeply unachievable. And so you shoot for the goals that you can achieve and you affect them in the places where they mean something when you achieve them. And because meaning something when you, like getting a outcome when you achieve a goal should mean communal benefits it should mean that like you see someone you directly affected and they say thank you and i think like that i think is is one of the weirdly positive uh consequences of living in this era is that in order to affect change in this era you return to a place where affecting change means you affect the person who is right next to you and therefore, you can directly benefit in some sort of holistic way, like w- like things like gratitude become more important now than they did years ago, um, where like your gratitude was someone who got your package two thousand miles away. Um, like I think that we are weirdly returning to an era where like you have to see someone right next to you and. Uh, I think that's like in some ways a good bad thing. No, I agree, and I also think that uh, literature is not just about edification or you know didacticism or anything like that. It's really about bringing to people a more full, a more full version of humanity. Really, I mean that that that's what it's about, and that's why we do what we do. Yeah. That's why it's why we're doing this podcast where we're talking to people that we uh that we that we know and love. Exactly. Like George. Like George. So why like George. Yeah. Yeah. And all- we we enrich each other in the same way that that art enriches uh the people that receive it, right? Uh experience uh, the, the 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 enriching of the fleeting uh existence, right? Some some joy, some ecstatic now that happens when we watch the series finale of a great TV show, or when we uh, go back, we, we, we return to that book that has meant so much to us, and, and scan through for that one paragraph that we just can't get enough of. Right? I mean, it's in, in a lot of ways, it's the cultivation and the and the and the intelligent um, 
uh, sort of obsession, right? I mean, we it's it's okay to be obsessed with something. I mean, uh, it, in, in many ways, that's what being alive is, right? I mean, our obsession is we don't want to lose it, we don't want to we don't want to let it go, so we 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 dig our claws into that to that great book, and then we as writers have the have the additional privilege of of having you know, hundreds of books and works and paintings and television shows and movies and songs that, that we pour into, then we then pour into, siphon into that thing that we make, right? It's it's trying to give back, trying to to grind it all down and 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 recycle through yeah. our individual subjective uh, you know, uh, uh, life. Uh, and that's I for, for me, as I as I assume for for many creatives, uh, the 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 three of y'all, including Katie there, uh, uh, right. I mean, that's why we, we do it because we, you say it's not about, um, so much self edification, Brian, I completely, I completely agree. But, uh, you know, I think for a lot of us, this is a, this is a compulsion, right? We, we have a compulsion. We, we take in, we have to have some output. There's only so much input we can, we can have before we have to make something with it. Right. Yeah. And, and all right. All right, guys, we're going to client, we're, we're going to, we're going to close this down. Uh, it's been a, it's been a long hour. I am sufficiently fucking hammed off the bone. I'm this George po- this George poor. <laughs> I'm yeah, serious. It, I'm at, I'm I'm struggling. I'm struggling. Yeah, Williams to, is gone. I'm I'm struggling. Yeah, it actually kind of it, it's very it's very low. It's, it's a few fingers at best. I'm struggling to talk on, straight. George? I mean, we're not like we're just talking to George, right? Like we're, I'm just gonna. <laughs> yeah, are you coming yeah. up soon, George? <laughs> We we really While we want have to. you. I certainly George hope to if I can find work. Okay. Yeah, but you know I'm gonna wind this down. Okay. And yeah, jo- Devin's upset. I I'm understand. Deep upset. Devin Devin's having a fun time. That's why you know that's that's what we do here. <laughs> okay, that's it for today's episode. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe and review on whichever platform you're listening. You can get in touch with us on Twitter at Animal Riot Press or Facebook and Instagram at the same name or through our website AnimalRiotPress.com. This has been the first episode of the Animal Riot podcast with your host, Brian Birnbaum, and featuring Devin Kelly and George Sawaya. Transcripts for our deaf and hard of hearing animals are provided by Jonathan Kay, and we are produced by me, Katie Rainey. See you later, you filthy animals. And that's it for tonight. Thank you very much. Woo! We're done. See ya. Hey, not bad, fellas. Did we we get too serious? Should Should we have had a little more fun? Belly.